All right, everyone. So I think we should be good to start. It's great we've got some representation, I think, from all over the country here. So obviously any presentation we're going to give like this is a bit fluid. It's a bit of a one-size-fits-most approach like most baseball caps. So if there are any questions or things you feel are not addressed from your perspective specifically, certainly feel free to ask those questions in chat or certainly send a private message to my co-presenter, Melanie Smith, as well with regards to what issues you may be having. So welcome this evening to Thriving in GP Training, what to expect, how to thrive and how to advocate for yourself. My name is Dr. Sama Balasubramanian. I'm a fourth term general practice registrar doing my extended skills in Western Sydney. And I'm also a board member for GPRA. And my colleague here, Melanie Smith, is the president of GPRA. So Melanie, you can introduce yourself as well. Hi guys, um, thanks for coming along tonight. Um, I live in Adelaide, I work in out of metro practice. I um, fellowed ooh, almost 12 months ago, but um, was a previous RLO for Skirt Flurio and GPEX and been involved with the advisory council for GBRA for a couple of years. Um, and towards the end of my training, I uh, took on this role. Um, and, and enjoying um, the challenge um, and dealing with all the changes in GP training. Um, and hope that you guys enjoy um, starting off in practice this year. So I'll leave it up to Sama to take you through the presentation this evening. Um, as you questions, um, feel free to either in the group chat or message me and I can pass them through. We will have a Q&A at the end. Um, and hopefully we'll cover everything you guys need to know. Fantastic. Thanks, Mel. So look, from our perspective, so we're doing this presentation on behalf of GPRA. And as we've got walk through, as Mel mentioned, any questions or things you feel may be able to be answered a little bit better or with some more clarity, certainly type them in the group chat or message Mel. Um, and make sure that if there's something you feel we didn't address appropriately even after the presentation has ended, certainly contact us. And there are ways to contact us that we'll let you know about at the same time. Elena, is that better now? Can you can you hear me over here? Okay, so I'll keep going now. Alrighty, so we'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country, wherever you may be in this great nation of ours, uh, representing the Indigenous partners of our land and the Indigenous owners of our land and their elders past and present, and that also extends to any Indigenous registrars we may have present here as well. So the objectives of this presentation that we're doing are really quite simple. It's all about finding out what you need to expect from your clinic, from your supervisor and yourself coming into this new term of general practice at starting, making sure that you've got some resources on hand to assist you in that self-advocacy and advocating for yourself because you are really your strongest advocate. And our role here is to try and improve that facet and give you some resources to make sure that you're well protected going forward into the future. The next thing is talking about the key list of individuals to contact when in need of assistance. So I just start with a simple abbreviation. So there's, as you may or may not have noticed already, there are plenty of abbreviations we use in general practice not just from the clinical aspects, but also from the administrative side of things. So a few of the ones we're going to use today, as I'm sure everyone knows through the RACGP, ACRAM and the AMA are already, they're well known. A few I'd like you to know is General Practice Registrars Australia, so that's the peak voice and the advocacy body for registrars in this country. General Practice Supervisors Australia, who are the organisation that represent our general practice supervisors. ME stands for Medical Educator, who you may have already been assigned to in your current RTO. RLO is a Registrar Liaison Officer, so you can think of them as being individuals who are elected to represent registrars in different regions. And we'll talk about the role of the RLO and they fit into helping you out during the training. And the RTO just means Regional Training Organisations. So for example, in New South Wales, the RTO is GP Synergy. 
I'd also use the caveat that we may also have international medical graduates here and individuals who may be on the independent fellowship pathway program. So whilst a lot of our presentation is geared in the current AGP, TRTO, RS, CGP and ACRAM context, we really do speak to all registrars as well and we're here to advocate for all registrars. So first things first, in terms of what you can expect from a clinic, always talk about adequate setups important. You need orientation, you need payslips, and you need patient billings. So these are sort of four concepts that we'll examine a bit closely. So in terms of setup and orientation, so you need a room with equipment. Now the equipment provided by practices can be variable. That can change from RTO to RTO and indeed from practice to practice. And the reality is not all practices do provide otoscopes as much as they may be required to provide so. So, okay. am I back now? Okay, cool, okay. So if I'm back, yep. So, so you know, so the equipment can vary between practices. Second thing are resources. So different resources may be provided by your RTO. So many RTOs have access to therapeutic guidelines, for example, and you can access that from whatever online registrar portal that the RTO provides you in terms of logging things like your training hours and things like that. The other thing to think about is an orientation checklist and that's actually been done by GPSA. And we'd advise you to actually have a look at that as well and see some of the kinds of things that are covered by that and ensure that that can guide you and your supervisor in making sure you're well prepared starting your term. Understanding the practice processes, and that's also in terms of how do recalls work in terms of results? How do we follow up results from patients? How do I inform patients of their results? Do I always do a follow up appointment? Can I call them about their results? There are lots of different nuances change from practice to practice. So it's important to make a list and know that you can ask about those things when you do your orientation that again, you're well prepared and you can practice that over the course of your first term. The other important thing are remembering the medico-legal dimensions as well. So thinking about things like red flag presentations, what are things that I should call my supervisor for in the first term? And there are things such as fever in a child of less than six months, any rash in a child of less than 12 months when you're a first term registrar. So there's a few things that can vary in terms of recommendations from training organisation to training organisation, and certainly gauge your supervisor's perspective when you start in terms of what they think you should call them about and what they think they'd be happy for you to manage on your own. And that's a process where you learn from each other, adapt over time, and then the amount of times you contact them does decrease a little as you go throughout the term. Payslips are a very important thing. So we need to ensure that they're provided and you need to make sure that they're accurate. And the most important thing to check in terms of accuracy are, is the base rate correct in terms of me being a GPT-1? And you can look at the NTCER to see what your base rate's supposed to be. And also making sure that you get paid for the hours you actually work. So whilst different practices can log training hours differently, if you work extra hours, make sure that you're paid for that. If you work less hours, make sure it's adjusted accordingly. So just make sure you're on top of the pay slips from the first fortnight of pay, so that you're not chasing things up later on in terms where it can be a bit more difficult to sort out money matters. Fair Work also states that pay slips need to be given to you within one working day of pay day, even if you're even if an employee is on leave. So even if you go on annual leave, if payday is on the second week of annual leave, you should receive a slip stating that your annual leave has been paid out and how many hours of it have been paid out as well. Now, the other thing to keep an eye on are leave balances. It's not much of an issue because we often have six to 12 month terms, but just know you should be able to allow, be allowed to access that information. Certainly if you've only taken say three days of annual leave, we're gonna take extra afterwards to make sure you're on top of how much of an entitlement you have left. Now, one important point is really patient billings. So you need to know that anything billed under your provider number is your responsibility. And the flip side of that is the practice has a legal responsibility to give you your billings. So the software can demonstrate these things in real time. So you need to make sure you're on top of this early. 
And this is a really important point because it's very, very rare, but certainly some problems have happened in general practice where billings can be tampered with or may not be entered incorrectly from the reception's perspective. So it's really important to think about your responsibility in that role. So I think Mel also wants to say something about it as well. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in and make sure you're all aware that there is some good online training um, that Human Services Department provide on, on the MBS. Um, and I'll put a link in the chat. Um, they have some e-learning tools and you, your RTO may point you to them, but there's a sort of basic introduction to how the MBS works and some links uh, um, to info on the item numbers that you'll most likely be using. Um, as I said, probably your RTO will give you some info on that in your orientation, um, but it's a good thing to go through those learning modules online if you have a chance. Because um, as Sam has already said, it's really important you understand um, billing and Medicare rebates and, and how that all works because it is your responsibility. Um, really important point to understand. Fantastic. Thanks, Mel. So as Mel mentioned, yeah, absolutely. The MBS module will be a great place to start. And certainly have a chat to your supervisor if you're unsure about billings as well. At the end of the day, we talk about learning about billings, not in terms of gaming the system appropriately, but actually about earning what you're worth and knowing that you're getting remunerated uh, appropriately for the work that you put in. And it takes a bit of time to develop those skills and certainly senior GPs work on that over a long period of time as well. So it's nothing you need to know all of a sudden overnight. Just know that working on your billings is actually a work in progress and that's something you can improve over time. So that's where you can gain guidance from the MBS or Medicare Benefit Schedule modules as Mel has, a, has linked in the chat there. Have a chat to your supervisor and certainly discuss with your peers as well with regards to that. So make sure you're on top of it early. So practice softwares do demonstrate these billings and what you can talk to your either IT manager, practice manager or supervisor about is getting an introduction to accessing these things yourself. So by clicking about two or three buttons in most practice softwares, you can actually get a full list of real time billings for you for the day, for the month or for any given period. Now, in terms of what to expect from your supervisor, we always talk about three aspects. One is accessibility. So accessibility is a difficult one to approach comprehensively, but just think about it in terms of if I'm a registrar seeing a patient that I'm not sure what I'm doing and not sure what I'm sort of approaching this problem with, or I'm not sure how to approach this problem, then I need to know that my supervisor is available for me to either contact or have come in with me to co-review the patient or even do corridor teaching with to figure out sort of what the next plan is going to be. So that level of support is really important. Um, and at the end of the day, for a GPT-1, there are different recommendations between training organisations in terms of what so-called in-practice supervision will be. So just make sure you clarify that with your training organisation in the first week as to how much they expect your supervisor to be on site whilst you're practising. The other important thing to think about is your protected teaching time, which is one on one. And I'll touch on that a little bit later in terms of how you can facilitate that for yourself. And also expecting a level of pastoral care and support, because it's not just about the scientific and the medical aspect in terms of what you give to patients. You can also take home a fair burden of the patient consults as well with you. So it's important you have a supervisor that you can debrief with, bounce ideas off and get some support in terms of how you're feeling as well. In terms of what to expect from yourself, it's really, really simple. You know, it's open and honest communication, making sure you're willing to learn, adapting and learning what sort of general practice training works for you. Not everyone works exactly the same way. Some people like to make lists of patients that they want to discuss with their supervisor at the end of a session. Some people like learning as they go. So it's all about adapting to what works for you, what works within the context of the practice and with your supervisor and then adapting that over time if situations and circumstances do change. It's important to develop a learning plan and most RTOs do either have software on their online GP registrar portal, should have an ability for you to make a learning plan. 
a medical educator can also guide you with regards to filling in gaps in your knowledge, making sure you cover appropriate topics and improving those things in clinical practice. And another important thing to think about is working on conflict resolution. And that's really where the self-advocacy comes into it. So the way we look at conflict resolution is remembering that each disagreement opens an opportunity for self to negotiate and find a solution for both parties. Now, again, that's dependent on the situation, but we know that time and time again, regardless of the brevity or how tough the situation may be that you're having, we know that those facets of that open, honest, early communication and early conversations results in early solutions and utilise your advocates quite early. So that's GPRA and your Registrar Liaison Officer will be local to your region and you'll be able to access those RLO details from either the GPRA website or they will be provided by your RTO or have been already. And also individuals within the RTO. So your medical educator is also a nice step. And Fair Work also has an online learning module on having difficult conversations. But again, that's quite generic in its approach and it's not completely specific to the general practice legal context. In terms of how to thrive for yourself, I like breaking it down into a few different domains. So professionalism is important, how to figure out your educational arrangements, how to figure out breaks and fatigue management, thinking about leave and particularly thinking about leave early and what's called clinical relationship building with your supervisor. So professionalism really comes into a couple of different things. So it's punctuality, so making sure you're on time. And that's not about running your patient consultations on time. That's a different thing. So patient consultations, particularly when you're a GPT-1, tend to run a bit longer than some of the seasoned and hardened GPs. Um, and at the end of the day, it's not about finishing to the dot all the time. But it's important that if you're starting at nine in the morning, be there five minutes early, be there 10 minutes early, demonstrate your commitment. If you're going to be late, be prompt with your communication in terms of what's going on and make sure you take care of your administrative workload and administrative burden so it doesn't get too much. So these are things like practice logs. So remember your clinical practice must be complemented by your professionalism. So you must be professional and then you can work appropriately on your clinical practice. So the two marry together quite well. This is just a list of common tasks that people tend to leave quite late. And by late, I mean not just when they start training, but also a bit further along in the term. So things like your practice log. So that may vary from RTO to RTO in terms of how you log how much clinical training you're doing. But whatever the method, make sure you're trying to log that every week to two weeks at the latest so that you're not playing catch up at the, at the end of term and figuring out did I work 38 hours that week? Did I do 36 hours? Not quite sure. If you do it as you go, takes that burden off you as you move forward into the next term. So as much as you may not think so at the moment, it actually runs through quite quickly in general practice. And before you know it, you'll be going from one term to the next. So you don't want a roadblock stopping you from either applying to new practices for the next term or applying for things like exams and stuff. Again, the learning plan is really important and that's where you're medical educator can facilitate you in developing that plan and your supervisor can also help you identify those knowledge gaps and ways to address them as well. Making sure you're having teaching advisory meetings with your medical educator. So that's what they call it at my RTO. There may be a different name in different RTOs as well, but these are routine meetings with your ME. Doesn't always need to be in person, at least over the phone, where you take the initiative and say, I haven't had my two meetings this term, so I'm going to say, Okay, March, I'm going to do one, and then June, I'm going to do one. And you book those times in, so you know you're going to meet your medical educator, make sure you're staying on top of your goals, and make sure you've got time to receive guidance and advocacy during your training. It's also important to keep on top of any online modules or educational activities that your training organisation may want you to do, and ensure you do things like such as your recognition of prior learning earlier on so you don't miss the colour. So for those of you who don't know, some registrars are eligible to claim some of their training time that they've done in hospital towards their general practice training time. Obviously that varies from personal experience and from RTO to RTO. So just confirm with your medical educator whether or not you can lodge it and how that process will be. 
but I'm sure many of you already know about RPL already. Now, in terms of the educational arrangements, so how to sort this stuff out in practice, think about driving the process yourself. So don't be a bystander. Make sure you make that time for both yourself and for your supervisor. And the key word here, the operative word is protected. So it needs to be one-on-one. -on -one. And for a GPT-1, at least in a New South Wales context, it's one and a half hours per week. And always consider arranging it for the start of a session as well. So if you arrange it for the start of a session, you're actually less likely to miss it due to either patient emergencies or things coming up in between. And make sure that that is also paid time as well. So that's something that your supervisors get paid for in order to deliver you the appropriate education. So if you're the one going to reception and saying, you know what, I work on a Tuesday morning, my supervisor gets here at 10 o'clock, I get there at 10 o'clock, and you tell them 10 to 11.30, let's book in my you know, protected teaching time. Clarify that with your supervisor and then you've locked it in. And then once you've locked the time in, then you can think about what are the things I need to discuss with my supervisor? What are the patient cases I want to examine? What are the concepts or topics I want to discuss? So adopt a structured approach, but again, your structured approach to clinical learning involves a structured approach to the administrative side of things. So that marries itself together. The other important concept is breaks, fatigue management and leave. So general practice can actually be quite tolling. You can get burnt out. So it's important to think about simple methods to figure out your breaks and managing your fatigue. So many registrars will actually apply what are called administrative time slots during your consulting time. So to give you a basic example, let's say you're working from 10 to 2 on a Saturday morning. Say 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock, you've got 15 minute slots in your appointment book. A method might be every three slots, you have a dummy slot where you can catch up either clinical consulting time, make any phone calls you need to make or chase any results you need to chase. So these sorts of things can ensure that one, you may be able to finish on time and two, you feel like you're getting on top of those administrative duties as well. It's also important to look after yourself as well. So having your own general practitioner is something you would have heard time and time again and will only reiterate it further. And the other thing in terms of leave is making sure you organise your annual leave early. So with annual leave, it's really important to remember that many other members in the practice may have been working for a lot longer, particularly some of the other sort of senior GPs there as well. So you need to make sure that you think about when you want to take your annual leave and notwithstanding emergency circumstances or where you need to take it all of a sudden, but thinking about this early means you've got a better chance of getting the annual leave when you want to take it. And then once you've slotted it in, it's slotted in. <clears throat> Again, with the NTCER, the National Terms and Conditions for the Employment of Registrars, section 16.2 does cover a clause about fatigue management. And we need to remember that sick and carers leave as a concept covers personal illness, caring responsibilities and family emergencies as well. So that's the definition lifted word for word out of fair work. So sick leave covers all of those things. The other aspect is that clinical relationship building. So think about facilitating what's called a give and take workplace arrangement. So general practice is quite in terms of flexibility for patient hours, taking time off and those sorts of things. So say, for example, you work one in every two or three Saturdays and you need to take a Saturday off to do X, Y, Z because you've got something on. So then what you can do is say, you know, say to your supervisor, look, you're working the weekend after. What I'd suggest is maybe we can swap that. Or let's say you're trying to organise education and supervisor says, I can't make it at a particular time, say that Tuesday morning example again. All right, so you can't make the Tuesday morning, know that's going to happen in advance and then rearrange the time for some other time that week. So try and get on top of these things early. Obviously, it's difficult to do these things perfectly, but think about it being sort of a bit of a give and take. So you give some, you take some, make sure you get on top of it early. And then also think about how can I be clinically relevant to this practice as well? So some registrars have done things like participating in clinical meetings or auditing the practice. Some people present articles or cases every week or every second week and ensure that you provide and receive constructive feedback. 
And that's not just about the clinical aspects of things. Your input is really important to actually drive what general practice is going to be in the future. So if you think some practice policies or processes need to either be updated or could be improved to a degree, or on the, the converse side, you think they're really good input, then what you can do is you can actually provide that feedback to your supervisor or practice manager as well. So then you're not only contributing clinically, you're actually contributing to the practice processes and the administrative side as well. Now, advocating for yourself is really a concept we want to hone in time and time again. And again, advocacy depends on the kind of problem you're having. So I'm going to go through these things one by one. And Mel, feel free to butt in at any point if you think there's something else you want to add on there as well. Um, and the concepts we're sort of going to cover are patient load and fatigue, education, leave, contract issue, pay, and any other reasons as well. Just a bit of a generic approach to problem solving and self-advocacy. So in terms of patient load, so again, recommended patient numbers might vary between training organisations. A safe number we suggest is two patients per hour if you're a first term AP registrar, and then you work your way up to three to four an hour, which is about one patient every 15 to 20 minutes. And from my personal experience, I'm speaking anecdotally, seems to be most GPT-1 registrars work up to about three patients an hour on average by the end of term. It's important if you find that the patient burden heavy, and that's not just the patient load itself, but the difficulty of the cases you're experiencing and how complex they can be, the first line of discussion always should be direct in the location the problem's having, happening. So that's with your supervisor. And you can also involve your medical educator early. So sending a simple email saying, you know, hi, Timothy, you know, I'm one of your registrars working in practice XYZ with supervisor XYZ. I've had some issues with fatigue because my patient load's been a bit high and give some examples of de-identified sample cases. I've worked with my supervisor to figure out, you know what, I'm going to take two administrative time slots on a Friday afternoon because the cases seem to be a bit more difficult. Do you think this is appropriate? Are there any other ways you'd suggest I manage the problem? So in that circumstance, then you've involved your ME. So again, early discussions, early solutions. This problem also applies to the converse aspect. So if your patient numbers are low, you may not be getting sufficient experience. The other important thing to think about is your on-call load for rural registrars as well. So if you're a rural registrar, Working in a regional or rural area, more often than not, you'll be on call for various facilities such as a hospital. It may be difficult to manage things such as your patient contact hours and general practice whilst you've been in hospital overnight managing three patients with pneumonia and one with sepsis. So it's actually difficult to stay awake for that time and be effective during that period. So having those discussions early, talking to your supervisor, talking to your medical educator, and certainly if you're in a circumstance where you think that situation may apply to you in the coming term, have that discussion with your supervisor earlier on so you can arrange appropriate sort of, you can, you can have appropriate arrangements to manage your time frames. Know that let say you have to take a few hours off in the morning to rest, that can be done appropriately and there's cover for you as well. So it's not just about you covering the patient, it's also about other doctors practice covering you as well and vice versa. Fatigue management is important because fatigue is a real effect of your training experience. So again, make sure you have your own general practitioner. So burnout and fatigue does happen. Uh, it happens more commonly than it is recognised. So it's important if you do feel those symptoms of burnout or those symptoms of fatigue, make sure to seek assistance directly from your supervisor, from your RLO and from your medical educator. And again, as an RLO, so myself and Melanie are RLOs as well, we can actually facilitate those difficult conversations, be it via email, in person, or sometimes over the phone as well. And your medical educator's role is there to facilitate that safe and that healthy training experience for you. So you've got people on your side if you're feeling burnt out of fatigue, where our biggest yeah. interest is you having a healthy training experience, a safe training experience, and being the best GP registrar, and general practitioner you can be. So we want you to be not just a great clinician, but we also want you to be happy and healthy as well. 
So if you feel like you're finding some difficulties, you're experiencing that burnout, you're experiencing things like depression or anxiety, make sure to seek that assistance early and there are individuals involved who can help you in that context. I think Melanie wants to mention something as well. I just wanted to point out that a lot of the RTOs actually have support, particularly when people are going through a period of difficulty, whether that's burnout, whether that's other stuff going on in your life that's um, making training a little bit difficult at that particular time. Um, a lot of RTOs have sort of uh, like employee assistance programs where they can get you access to some psychological support. Um, so. There's access through RTO. There's also, if, I know certainly for the RACGP, um, if you're on the RACGP pathway for training, you will be a member and you can get access to some psychological support over the phone through your membership of the college. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether ACRAM has something the same or similar, but they may well do. Um, but probably the most important thing is, as um, Sam has mentioned, there's lots of people on your side and wanting to support you. The best thing you can do if you are experiencing any difficulties is to talk to people early and strong communication both within your practice and particularly with your medical educator and RTO are really, really helpful. Things go haywire when people kind of struggle um, and keep it to themselves and just kind of soldier on and then they get themselves into more and more, and more difficulty. So um, seek support early is the main message. Fantastic. Thanks, Mel. Now, in terms of education, so managing problems with education in clinical practice. So education is a bit of a broad concept. We're really talking about that in-practice teaching time, those corridor consultations where you either see them in the corridor, knock on the door, or even give them a phone call to ask them a question, and even things like educational release. So again, same process. You want to try and sort of discuss these matters directly with your supervisor and involve your medicator, medical educator as well early on. So we need to remember that supervisors have provided funding for doing in-practice education and covering things such as corridor consults. And they've signed an agreement with the RTO that when they take you on board as a GP registrar, they have a responsibility to provide a set level of education. So that education time each week needs to be protected. It needs to be one-on-one, -on -one, so it can't come in the format of a group clinical meeting. So if there's one supervisor in the practice with two GPT-1 registrars, then they need to do an hour and a half with one registrar and an hour and a half with another registrar. That's the agreement that they've signed up to. And always remember your RLO is there to support you. So I'd always suggest in terms of that pastoral care, that support and conflict resolution, these are the three individuals to involve early on. So it's your supervisor, your medical educator and your RLO. And if you think it's a bit of a simpler issue, sorting it out with your supervisor yourself, but you find that difficult sort of this discussion a bit tough to have, again, your RLO is there to support you. Now, in terms of leave, so organising leave arrangements or having issue with leave, particularly things like organising annual leave, trying to sort out sick leave, etc., make sure that your first port of call is your supervisor and practice manager. So that's managed directly in the practice setting. Again, consider contacting your RLO and your medical educator. And workplace bodies such as you know, Fair Work and the AMA have been used in the past in these sorts of scenarios, not all the time, and it's actually quite rare. And the circumstances where certainly we've seen Fair Work or AMA or someone like this get involved is really where early communication didn't happen or use of advocates didn't happen. So if you think about it from an advocacy perspective, the most important advocate is really yourself and our role as an RLO or GPRA and also your medical educator is help you help yourself. And if you find you're able to do that for yourself or you need a bit of additional assistance, that's where we can jump in and fight on your side. Now, the important thing is contract issues. So the biggest problem are with terms not being honoured. So these are things such as agreed hours not being honoured during the contract and you had commitments to go to as well. So again, we suggest direct discussion with your supervisor or practice manager. Now, you need to use your discretion in this circumstance. So if you feel like perhaps I might be ruffling a few too many feathers or might causing a few problems by having that discussion with the supervisor or practice manager, or you feel there's 
a personality clash or a difference of opinion, that's where your RLO and GPRA are here to support you. So shoot an email straight away or call or contact straight away. Make sure you involve your medical educator in the RTO as well. Because when it comes to contract issues, it's important to settle these things early and remember that we never want your training time to be compromised. So as long as you can figure issues out early, then you can ensure that those sorts of problems don't happen. And the flip side of that is that's where your advocate time can be used, but certainly use your discretion in terms of which issues you want to discuss directly with your supervisor or practice manager, or which issues you want to seek some further support or advice before going down that pathway. So the only concern, so there's no concern too small, and the only silly questions are the questions you don't ask. And certainly from the RLO and GPRA and also the medical educator perspective, we're coming from an unbiased approach in terms of your problems, here to listen to your concerns, hear what your expectations are of the, the situation and figure out solutions with you that'll work best for you and work, work best for the practice as well. So we're on your side. Pay is an important thing we, we get spoken about time and time again. And I think this is the commonly most common discussed issue um, in terms of pay. And those are things like pay not coming through on time, insufficient innovation, and issues with calculating the billing percentage. Again, direct discussion with the supervisor or practice manager is suggested. Accountants do make mistakes. Computers do make mistakes if the wrong parameters were entered in. So more often than not, we can approach it from the perspective of an honest mistake and then work to rectify an error, collaborate and communicate with our practice manager. And then what you do is you build your relationship as well as solve the problem for them. So you're doing them a favour with regards to rectifying these things. Make sure to utilise your RTO, our RLO for support. And we can also double check the discrepancies with you as well. So if you get a list of billings and you say, you know, you do ID identify, we've got the numbers there, look, I've worked this term, this is what I got paid so far, this is my billings, this is what leave I've taken, is this the difference that I'm supposed to be paid? And then calculating it appropriately, we can actually help you with double checking that. Ensure and make sure that you know your ME is a good support in this circumstance as well, time and time again, as I mentioned, facilitating that safe and healthy training experience for you. And really the AMA or other bodies can get involved as well. And again, that's where the early discussions and the early communication didn't really happen. Other issues can be wide and varied. So you're not, just remember that you're not alone in your process. So you are one part of your support network that's here for you. Your RLO is there, your medical educator is there, GPRA is there, and you can also draw upon the AMA and your training college as well. So you're not alone in this process. Certainly there will often be issues that you feel may not have been experienced by someone before or are completely individualized to your context. And in that circumstance, really what that presents to you is an opportunity to find a solution that's good for you as a registrar, but also will be good for future registrars coming to that practice and in other practices as well. So your learnt experience can actually help improve general practice training for everyone because that's how we develop a troubleshooting manual. So another concept I just wanted to touch on quite quickly is called managing the mid consult. So I received a few messages um, about check doing things like checking guidelines and clinical core uh, resources in the middle of a consult or utilizing your supervisor. So I've just noted some sort of simple ways you can facilitate that discussion as not all of us may have the same confidence or clinical acumen to be able to say, you know, I know exactly what this is every time. So some ways that have been suggested to me by other registrars and supervisors. So let's say you're in a consult with a patient, trying to figure out antibiotic dosage or what medication you need to give someone, want to look up therapeutic guidelines, but make sure you don't lose face. Lines to use might be, let's see what the latest evidence suggests just want to make sure you're getting the latest treatment, that should be latest treatment, and let me just confirm we're using the right dosage for this medication. And in terms of utilising your supervisor, the important thing is not to be afraid to contact them. So things such as just check with one of the other doctors to see if they can do the same thing. Let me ask another doctor's opinion, or 
use sort of broad and general terms like signposting for different histories. A child with a rash always like to have two pairs of eyes to ensure they receive the best quality care. And then what you've done is you've reassured the patient, provided additional assistance, show you're not afraid to ask for help. And in that context, you actually see him a more clinically professional individual. And I think Mel wants to say something as well. I just wanted to say that um, a lot of the time patients love it if you look up extra information or you bring in someone else to look at them. They kind of feel like they're getting two for one. Um, so don't be hesitant at any stage and don't feel like you will lose faith. Um, by asking for help, um, particularly you know with a, a difficult uh, diagnostic dilemma or you know choosing between different management options for something, um, you'll generally find that patients are really really receptive to it, and they'll sort of congratulate you on how thorough you are. So um, don't ever let the, that idea of losing faith sort of hold you back from seeking the help you need. Um, the other really useful thing that I often use is pulling up the patient information sheet. On particular conditions, and you know, sort of running through it with the patient, and also refreshing my knowledge of whatever the condition is at the same time, that can also be really useful and, and helpful. And they love patients love to have something to take home. So if you can print out an information sheet and give it to them to take home, um, all the better. Yep, completely agree, Mel. Completely agree. And I think my my clinical practice and those of my colleagues as well and friends reflect exactly that. So again, coming back down to the tail end or the pointy end of the stick, early discussions, early questions, early solutions. That's the key word here. The operative word is early. So remember to be open-minded, empathise with your supervisor, see things from their perspective as well, and that'll enable you to give a more balanced approach to the problem as well. Be honest in terms of what you're saying and what you're feeling and make sure to stick to your gun. So if you feel like something's not quite right, follow your nose, you're probably right. And that's where your advocates come into it. So again, talking about GPRA. So GPRA is really your advocate, your voice and your organisation. So it's the member driven organisation for general practice registrars in this country, regardless of whether you're training with an RTO or not. Membership is free, certainly join today, and certainly you're already part of GPRA if you've gone on to this presentation. We've also got things such as educational resources, and I'll go through a couple of other things we're working on in the slide as well. So in terms of some basic resources, so you'll also have a copy of this, or you'll get a copy of this presentation afterwards as well. So GPRA, so we're working, we've worked on a document called Getting Started in Your GP Training, a quick guide and all the RLOs at your orientations moving forward into the next term will have access to a copy of this document and most likely we'll be able to print them out and provide them to you. So it's a two A4 sheet guide in terms of getting started, some quick tips and tricks. It also covers a few issues people discussed and a few questions people suggested about what do I study or what are some resources I can take starting the term. And it also talks again and talks to that concept of conflict resolution adequate communication, open communication, um, and resolving issues early and who your advocates are in the system. It's important you're also familiar with the NTCER, so the National Terms and Conditions for the Employment of Registrars. And I think the relevant aspects to talk about from there would essentially be, you know, think, looking at the leave perspective, looking at the, um, the wages and how much is supposed to be paid and the billing percentages. And having a little look, if you do have an issue with something that's happening and you feel it's related to contracts or something to do with how you're paid, check the NTCER first. There should be a relevant section and then see what it suggests with regards to that. Because when your supervisor takes you on board, they agree to the NTCER being the minimum terms and conditions for you starting in that clinical practice. Always have a look at the Fair Work Ombudsman if you think there's something happening with regards to leave arrangements or something not being taken forward. The Fellowship Pathways policies talk about what's expected of you as a trainee in your clinical practice and the various ways to sort of become an RACGP fellow. I will state that's RACGP only. I haven't got the ACRAM link or any of the others at the moment. Um, and also that's the orientation checklist here from General Practice Supervisors Australia. 
So that goes through a little one page document that you and your supervisor can sit down, nut out and tick together. It takes about 10, 15 minutes in total. And you can do that on your first day just to make sure that all the basic processes of clinical practice where you're working are taken care of. So coming down to the Q&A, I think before we um, sort of launch into all the other aspects um, that I'm sure you guys are sort of willing to talk about, just wanted to talk to a couple of things specifically people have sent us. So two things people have sent us were about, one person asked about managing paediatric patients, another patient, another individual asked us about how study hours the night after work is ideal, and another person discussed about study groups. So from all those concepts, the RTO should be able to cover from that perspective, and the RTOs do have some good um, sort of tips and tricks and also presentations and workshops in terms of how to study for exams and prepare. And certainly that's the space GPRA will be occupying coming into the next term. So just keep an eye on your email inbox and keep an eye on the GPRA website and we'll be, we'll be also doing some work from that perspective. So coming to the floor, Mel, is there anything else you wanted to discuss before we sort of open up the floor to everyone to ask questions? Um, I guess, yeah, just going through some of the questions that people had sent through, um, there are some, obviously we've talked about, um, you know, how to handle it when you don't really know what to do when you get a new presentation. And um, we've talked about asking for help, looking up resources, um, and people have asked about sort of the best resources out there, um, books and things like that. Certainly, um, obviously, your therapeutic guidelines, your Australian Medicine Handbook, um, if you've um, got access to UpToDate, that can be useful. Um, there's also the, the old uh, Murta, um textbook um, that can be useful when you're starting out and a little bit um, around exam preparation. Um, don't forget your college websites. Um, both RACGP and ACRIM have lots of really good resources online and specific sort of online learning programs. Um, and sets of guidelines and things like that that you can look at. Um, there's also resources like the Royal Children's Hospital has got a great set of clinical guidelines online mm. and you know, diagnostic imaging pathways from WA. There's lots of good stuff you can have online and I'd really suggest that as, a, as you're starting out in practice, um, maybe having your, your web browser open and a whole lot, and sort of a set of bookmarks, your favourite resources that you can access um, you know, with a single click is really helpful. Um, I know my um, desktop has got everything sort of right up in that, that top line of my browser. Um, things like Dermnet, I would look at Dermnet every day um, and show patient images um, and to help me confirm a diagnosis. Um, and I'm pulling up ETG all the time. Um, we've also, and, and I guess that's sort of how you, you help to, to deal with some of your uncertainty is looking for resources. Um, also, don't be afraid to bring patients back um, and to review them um, and you know, even to phone them after they've gone home to check on how they're going. Do the things you need to do to, to help you sleep at night um, is a really key message. Um, and if you have particularly with children, um, often you want to sort of see them within a day or two to review how they're going if you're not entirely sure, whether, you know, if you're trying to work out whether something really is just viral. Um, or whether it's something more sinister, um, don't be afraid to bring patients back frequently and review them. And you learn heaps by seeing um, the way an illness progresses over time, and that's probably something that's that's quite different to what you may have experienced in hospital-based medicine in the past. Um, what other sort of questions did we get? Ah, there was a question around um, what are the are there some presentations that early GPT-1 registrars tend to see a bit more or less compared to other GPs. And I would say um, you'll probably see a lot more paediatric um, in some respects because you'll get a lot of the on the day kind of consults often because you don't have an established patient base when you're starting out and you don't have people um, booking in weeks in advance. So a bit of P um, and those sort of acute presentations which may be your comfort zone, particularly if you've done a lot of time in ED before coming into general practice. You'll probably see a little bit less of the chronic disease management, but you may see little um, 
snippets of that if people can't get into their usual GP and they, they come see you. And that's a great way to develop some um, relationships with patients over time if you're sort of helping them out when they can't see their usual GP. Um, and I think that's, oh, there's a bit about time management. I think Sam has touched on that a bit. Um, and I guess that that's a, a really a big question um, and, and a difficulty for all really and you know um, later stage registrars the eternal battle of the the GP really is time management and incorporating the many many different demands in your time through the day um, and that's something we'll, you'll probably hear more about from RLOs um, and from your RTO during orientation and talk to your supervisor about as you go along. Um, that's probably all I'm thinking I've got from my list of pre-questions. We've had a couple more come up in the chat. Um, there's a question about potential for maternity leave. Um, is that something that needs to be in the contract? Okay, an important thing to realise that when you're in a GP registrar working in private practice, um, you don't generally, um, unless there is a particular provision by your particular employer, you don't generally get access to paid maternity leave. Um, you will sort of under the auspices of Fair Work have some access to um, unpaid uh, maternity leave, but it's quite difficult because for GP registrars, you're generally on six or maybe 12 month contracts. Um, so it's often um, quite a different situation than you will have been used to working in hospitals um, and it's a big dis disadvantage of general practice um, in a lot of ways. So if you do have particular questions around maternity leave, um, probably best to talk to your RLO um, or give us a call and talk through your individual circumstances. Um, generally. Um, it is good to let your employer know as soon as possible, but obviously that depends on your comfort level as to when you want to um, let them know what's going on in your life. Um, but you certainly are able to take time out of training for maternity leave. That's not an issue. Generally though, you won't be paid for it. You only have access to um, the federally funded sort of public um, parental leave scheme. Um, um, there's a question around if you're applying for maternity leave during training time, um, how do the terms work out? That's kind of tricky because obviously you often don't have a lot of control over when you take maternity leave. So unfortunately it often doesn't sort of fit perfectly in with your, your six month terms. Um, but that generally isn't a problem for RTOs um, and it, it will vary between RTOs as to how they manage it. Um, some places it'll be easy to sort of come back when you feel you're ready, um, but a lot of it depends on finding an appropriate placement for you, and that may be in the placement you're in prior to going on maternity leave, or it might be in an entirely new placement. So, um, how your RTO manages the placement process, because obviously that varies a lot across the country. Um, in some RTOs, it's sort of a free market. You apply to where you want to work. In other RTOs, you're pretty much told exactly where you have to go for training. So um, talk to your RTO. It's, it's probably how you're going to incorporate that into your training time and where you'll transition from between the different terms. Um, Sana, did you want to answer the question around your very first network? Oh, that, um, yeah, I'm so <laughs> yes. First things first. The first thing to expect on your very first day would be a combination of incredible nerves and and some excitement. Um, those would be the two things to expect, I think, emotionally. Um, in terms of seeing patient orientation, sitting in with your supervisor, it really does vary from practice to practice it will usually evolve an orientation to start. Whether that orientation goes for one hour, two hours, etc., is difficult to say, but the orientation is essential in terms of getting familiar with the practice software, practice processes, and figuring out how to actually see patients in the practice. Because there's a difference between clinically reviewing a practice, or clinically reviewing a patient, sorry, and then actually being able to type the notes, 
writing scripts, ordering pathology forms, imaging, writing referral letters, and then doing the administrative side of things that complement your clinical practice. So that would essentially be the usual start is with an orientation for about one to two hours. Now, some supervisors do have registrars sit in, and I've heard tales of some registrars sitting in for half a day, some registrars sitting in for close to a week. It does vary from practice to practice. Myself, I was seeing patients on my own after a half day of orientation and sitting with my supervisor. And that seems to be how it's worked for most of my peers as well. So that's usually what I'd expect for my first day. It's really, you know, a great deal of nerves and also excitement as well. You will see some patients. You will certainly do some orientation or administration. Otherwise, you can't really work the system and the computer and the software. And then sometimes involves some sitting in with the supervisor as well, just to get a bit of the flavour of general practice, if I might use the term. Now, are there any other questions that people have? There was another question um, for when people were signing up. Um, someone asked about paperwork and how do you time the completion of that and do you do that post consult? Um, I think that's an important point to note um, when you're starting out in general practice. Um, do everything possible during the consult. Um, you, for most um, MBS item numbers, you cannot fill the time you spend not in front of the patient. So if you see a patient for uh, six minutes and or five minutes and then spend 10 minutes writing up notes, you can really only claim the appropriate item number for that five minutes. Um, so everything, if you need to do work, do it in front of the patient. Um, it's often a lot quicker that way too because you can clarify things. Um, and do it a lot more efficiently with the patient there. Um, and it sort of, it helps keep it fresh in your mind. Um, it also sort of speaks to the um, timeliness of record, which is an important aspect of professional practice. You don't want to be sort of just seeing patients, not writing anything down and then writing all your notes up um, in the evening. Um, that way danger lies. Um, um. I completely agree with you, Mel, with regards to that. Look, it, it does vary from person to person. I mean, I think, you know, yeah, typing as you go is important. Obviously, keep an eye on sort of your manners with the patient. So don't be typing the whole way through the consult is generally the, the suggestion. Um, but sometimes Absolutely. the referral letter, like what, what I do myself is, so as I'm typing the referral letter, you know, I'll clarify a couple of things with the patient. And sort of half the time I'll type the referral, but the other half I'll be doing my notes at the same time. So you can you you'll learn ways to manage that in your consults as well. Yeah. Now the the other question we've noticed, so Elena noted that sort of registrar hand said the first day we shouldn't see any patients. Look, the reality is this. There's no mandate in terms of that. That is a that is a recommendation um, that has been made, but at the end of the day. You know, if you do see patients in the first two days, I would say there's no reason in a supportive practice where you're not seeing too many patients in the first couple of days where you feel you're getting appropriate assistance for the patients. And even if you need to call your supervisor for every second patient for the first couple of days, that's perfectly fine. Um, in that circumstance, I don't think it would be unreasonable to be seeing patients. I wouldn't take it as gospel or too literally. Um, the flip side of that is making sure. So another person asks, how often should I, um, how often should I be contacting my supervisor as a GPT-1? And the reality is that does vary from person to person. So some of us who tend to be a little bit more on the, the, the anxious side of things, or we tend to double, triple check things, we may be contacting our supervisor more often. So let's talking about my context, for example. So when I started GPT-1, I probably was contacting my supervisor on average, at least about seven or eight times a day, if not doing other corridor consults and things as well. And that number de de decreases slowly over time, but you'll get a gauge in terms of how your supervisor thinks you're going, in terms of how, how that process is happening for you. 
because the most important thing really is being safe as well. And as Mel mentioned earlier, patients do love it when you get some extra advice or additional information. It is a bit of a two for one deal for them. So in terms of that, as long as your supervisor isn't getting aggrieved in that sense that you're contacting them so-called inappropriately, at the end of the day, what's appropriate or inappropriate is entirely up to you as a GP registrar. And you're really seeking the support of your supervisor in terms of managing those things better. Um, now, Johan sort of suggested, uh, Johan, sorry, I should say, um, thought you said we could include time allowed for reviewing and updating the clinical record. I think that's sort of, um, that's something Mel might be able to answer a little bit better. I, I'm not sure there's provision under the MBS, but Mel might know. I know I have been some very recent discussion on this on social media, um, but it certainly hasn't been a well accepted interpretation of the MBS. And Medicare is certainly um, a very slippery target when it comes to clarifying anything on the MBS. Um, and there was some thought that maybe this was more directed at the um, patient, uh, the my health record, um, the electronic sort of universal health record as to what that actually um, applied to, that interpretation. Um, so I think that may, that may be a newer way of interpreting it. I'm not entirely sure how well that would be accepted if you were audited by Medicare. Um, but at this stage, I certainly wouldn't rely on the idea that you can sort of spend time after a consult writing up notes and then you know increase your item number. So if someone walks out of your room after 18 minutes and spends six minutes um, writing their, their writing in the notes, I think you'd be pretty brave to then um, charge them an item 36 as opposed to a 23. Um, but that may be something that um, changes or is clarified in the future. <laughs> that particular one. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and look, I, I completely agree with you, Mel. That is, that is recent discussion more than anything. I'd always suggest watch that space. And as we mentioned about keeping an eye on the MBS criteria and those modules, be involved. Ask the questions again and again. Every three or four months, just ask yourself the question, am I billing, am I billing the right things? So always re-review your billings every few months would be the advice. Uh, now, Rekshani asked, is it needed to keep our own records of the patient theme daily? Um, look, it would really be for your own learning more than anything, because the record of the patient theme daily is on the practice software as it is, so it's not something you need to take home with you. Um, but I'd certainly say, you know, what our general approach is, you know, keep a notebook, keep a sheet of paper, even something like a Google document, for example, where you say, you know, Mr. AB who came in with XYZ with XYZ investigation. Um, you know, just talking about, I want to learn about Crohn's disease, I want to learn about faecal calprotectin testing, and then going to read up an AFP or Australian Family Physician article on that. So in that context, you know, you can keep a bit of a record. Again, some people operate by keeping a diligent record and they write down the name of the diagnosis for all the patients they see in a day. Other people don't write down any and keep what comes to mind. So it re it's really just what works for you, but there's no mandate in terms of what records you need to keep. Uh, now, Lewis also mentioned, what do we put in our practice log? Um, so in terms of you know, your practice log, remember that education days or educational release is the, is the term that we use is essentially um, logged as your normal clinical hours in a practice log. Um, and in terms of working five days in a week that contains education days to make up the extra hours, we go back to the NTCER and its clause in terms of educational release. If you're a full-time employee and you work 38 hours, including educational release, and you have to work for an extra day at the practice, then you're either given to, so you're given time off in lieu for that extra day. That's how it works. And I'm happy to clarify as well if I've if I've gotten that right. Yeah, basically, if you work four days a week normally, and then one of those days you have to take a day off to go to your compulsory education day, you should just get paid normally for that, um, and you shouldn't have to make up. Those, um, those hours on another day um, because that would actually put you sort of over the total amount of time. You'll just get paid at your base rate. It works a little bit differently if you are part-time, unfortunately, 
Um, but if you're full time, you will get paid for your compulsory education days. Um, and no, you don't have to make it up. If you did, if you work full time four days a week and have to go to a compulsory education day on the day that you normally don't work, then as Sama said, then you would actually get a day off in lieu. So you would, and that might be taken the next week or it would generally taken within, I think, one or two weeks um, of that extra day you've had to work. So that you shouldn't then be working nine days in a fortnight instead of eight overall um, because of sort of fatigue rules, um, basically, is the reasoning behind that. So you still get paid your normal base rate um, as sort of four days per week, you know, working out to full time hours across the fortnight. Um, and you should be sort of only having to be attending either training or work for that total amount of hours. Does that make sense? Good. Uh, Madeline asked ask the question around if you do work part time and if you don't usually work on the education day. Um, no, that is a difficulty. Um, you don't get paid, but I think, I'm trying to remember, this some, This might be one of the items that changed in the last interpretation, last negotiation round of the NTCR. I think now you can actually take that time in lieu possibly. I'm trying to remember. I'll have to go back and check on that. Um, or Sama, if you can remember. Um, it is. It doesn't work the same for part time and basically it's um, it's a tricky one and it is a point that they tried to have changed in the last negotiation round of NTCR but essentially you are disadvantaged in that respect if you're part time and you don't end up earning as much as a full time thing. No, that's right Elena, if you work two days a week and then on a different day that week you go do education, you won't get paid for that education day. Yeah, really, really look, look, looking at the NTDR now, it really, it does apply to full-time registrars, but there's no provision for part-timers there that I can see. Unfortunately, they're very explicitly um, differentiated, and I know that point came up in particular in the last negotiation. And we couldn't get any movement from the, um, the other party. So um, are there any other questions or, or burning issues that people want to discuss or, or cover or ask answers for? So I'll give you guys about maybe about 60 seconds, just if you've got any thoughts to come up with. Um, otherwise, we'd be looking at ending the present session. So I'll just give you guys a 60 seconds. I've just found a little couple of bits from the NTCR that I'll post in the chat just to clarify some of that stuff around uh, educational release. Pop that up. The GP Synergy Workshop will be paid on the basis that you're a full-time registrar. If you're a part-time registrar, then you'll be paid for half of the time you attend. That's how it works. Okay. 
So the GP Synergy workshop plan for the orientation or for any other is educational release. So it's not just I'm going there for orientation, it's also the clinical work as well. So that's what we mean by marrying the administrative and educational side of things. So that's all part of your GP training, not just clinical things, also administrative side of things as well. All right, everyone, so you're very welcome. You're very welcome in terms of presentation. So thank you to Sama um, for speaking to us all tonight and uh, running through all that really useful info. Um, as Sama has, has already said, if you guys have any more questions, feel free to contact us directly. Um, you can access our uh, email addresses via GPRA. Um, you can certainly contact me via president at gpra.org.au um, or you can chat to your um, local RTOs, registrar liaison officers. Again, you can um, find them on the GPRA website. Um, but thank you for coming along and thank you, Sama, for putting together such a, a um, in-depth presentation on how to start out and, and how to continue to thrive through your GP training experience. No worries, Mel. Thank you for your support and your help. And thank you, everyone, for coming along. Um, certainly keep an eye out for the next presentations that are going to be coming along. We're looking to follow you guys as you go through your term. Follow all GPT registrars and above and see what kind of additional support we can provide. And certainly at the end of the webinar, you'll be asked to provide feedback with regards to what has happened today. So certainly important things to note there are anything you think we haven't covered so well, anything you think we can change about the presentation or improve it. So we're only happy to take your feedback on board. And the other perspective is what kinds of webinars, what sorts of education and other things do you want to learn more about? Or what sort of space do you think GPRA can fill with regards to that as well? Okay. So more than happy to take your input on board. So thanks very much, guys. Thanks very much for attending. And we will see you guys, I'm sure, at another occasion. Thanks very much.